Welcome everybody. Um, it is it is my pleasure to to welcome you to to SAC. Uh, today's talk is by Howard Neuer. Neuer, not sure if I pronounced your name right. Uh, Neuer, Neuer. Neuer, sorry, Howard Neuer. Uh, it will be on the cohomology of a genetic shift in a K3 surface. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. And uh, this is reporting on joint work with Izet Koskun and uh, Kota Yoshioka. All right, so let's get started. Um, as a motivating question, let's consider the case of smooth projective curves over C of genus G. And we'll let R and D be a pair of uh, R as a uh, natural number and D as an integer. And we consider the moduli space of semi-stable sheaves on C of rank R in degree D. Okay, this is a kind of classical object to, to study. Um, and in classical Brillnotha theory, one asks the following question. So you ask, what is the co cohomology of the generic sheaf in the moduli space, right? And then you, I mean, you might have a, a, a reason to believe that you have an expected value for this cohomology, for the, for the cohomology values. And you can ask, does the generic uh, sheaf have at most one non-zero cohomology group, um, which is kind of what you would expect it to be. And in this case, we say that uh, the pair R and D has the weak real nother property. Now, the reason why this is such a useful, uh, I mean, a positive answer to such a question is so useful is that you can read the cohomology of your sheaf straight off from the Euler characteristic. So something that's purely numerical, um, and then from the, in this case, from the sign of um, D, whether it's positive or negative, uh, will tell you kind of uh, exactly what the values of cohomology are, if you know that it satisfies the weak ground other property. And so it's a very useful thing in terms of actually knowing what the cohomology of the generic moduli, uh, generic sheaf in your moduli space is. But the, the theory goes further and asks further questions, more, I mean, kind of deeper questions. And you might wonder what is the ge geometry now of the loci of sheaves where the cohomology is unexpected, right? It has unexpected values, um, not the generic one. And here you ask questions like, what's the dimension of, of this locus? How many components there are? And so on. And you want to know singularity, say. Uh, another question, uh, which is very classical, is, OK, suppose we know that the generic sheaf has the expected cohomology. Well, you can ask, is it globally generated? And this is a, you know, a very important uh, property for sheaves and, and very useful in, in, in lots of different contexts. Okay, and so all of these questions are known for curves, and uh, it's a very kind of beautiful triumph of classical algebraic geometry going through to the modern period. There's beautiful mathematics there, and a lot of the geometry of curves are really governed by uh, the answers to these questions. But in higher dimension already everything here becomes much more complicated. And to just kind of give us a, you know, set, up, set our, uh, our bearings here, we're gonna let X comma H be a polarized smooth projective surface over C, all right? So we're not gonna deal with any kind of complications from characteristic P today. Um, and we're gonna let E be a coherent sheaf that is pure. What that means is just that there are no subsheaves um, you know, of smaller dimension. So if it's, uh, if it takes up, if its dimension is the same as the dimension of, of X, then it's what you would call a torsion free sheaf. All right. So they're the same thing. It's just pure as a generalization to, um, to torsion sheaves. All right. And then we have the Hilbert polynomial, which, uh, I mean, is just the Euler characteristic of E whereas you tensor by higher and higher powers of, um, H. Okay. And we know by riemann roch that that gives us a polynomial of this form uh, right here. And we can form what's called the reduced Hilbert polynomial where we divide by the leading term, okay? So the leading term always matches the dimension. So if you have a, a dimension two sheaf, right? A sheaf on your whole surface, then you'd be dividing by A2. If you're dealing with a uh, pure uh, torsion sheaf that's supported along a curve, then you'd be dividing by A1 here. And classical, Giesinger's stability asks that, uh, or defines 
a Giesiger semi-stable sheaf to be one for which uh, all of its subsheaves have uh, asymptotically smaller reduced Hilbert polynomials. So in case I, I didn't say this explicitly, the little p, I write little p for the reduced Hilbert polynomial, okay? So you kind of have scaled away by, uh, by, by some information here. And this is a much stronger term uh, that the, you know, a uh, statement that the, the reduced Hilbert polynomial satisfies this property. Okay, so that, this is what it means to be Giesecker semi-stable. Um, are there any questions so far? No? Okay. So one of the beautiful things about uh, stability, and maybe you wonder why already on curves one, one needs stability to, to understand things. And the reason is that notions of stability allow us to break down objects of interest into canonical pieces that are, are easier to understand. And so in this case, uh, semi-stability gives us a unique harder in our simulant filtration. So it's a, I mean, that's what it's called, but it's a unique filtration into semi-stable factors. Um, and the way it's done is, is in such a way that they are of strictly decreasing um, reduced Hilbert polynomials. Okay, so it allows us to canonically break up any uh, coherent sheaf. Um, and on the other hand, uh, if you start with something semi-stable, then you can, break it down into stable factors, not necessarily in a unique way, but the associated graded object where you just take the direct sum of all the filtration factors, that is, a, uh, that is unique. Um, and that is well-defined. And when we say that two, uh, two semi-stable sheaves of the same reduced silver polynomial are S equivalent if their associated grader, graded, fact, uh, graded objects are the same, or isomorphic. Is what I mean here. Okay. And so while it's much easier to prove the existence of nice moduli spaces for curves, it took much longer uh, to, to do it for, for surfaces. And this is the product of uh, the work of uh, Giesker and Mariyama, where they proved that there exists a coarse moduli space, a projective coarse moduli space of S equivalence classes of semi-stable sheaves on X of a given churn character. And the point is that uh, a moduli, I mean, you, you're not gonna get a nice uh, moduli space that you know, can separate uh, two things that are S equivalent, but uh, if you just are uh, parameterizing the S equivalence classes, then you can get a nice moduli space, okay? And so this is kind of what we have to deal with if you want nice moduli spaces, or at least coarse moduli spaces. Um, and just to kind of connect this back to the notion of stability for curves, that stability was defined in terms of something called the slope. And so just to let you know that, I mean, of course you can do that for uh, surfaces as well. And you define that for torsion-free sheaves. And you say that a torsion-free sheaf is slope semi-stable or mu semi-stable if all sub-objects sub with intermediate rank, so rank greater than zero, but smaller than the rank of your torsion-free sheaf E, um, if the slope, which is defined by uh, multiplying H with the first turn class and then dividing by the rank times h squared. So that's the slope. And so you want the sub objects to have strictly smaller slope if it's stable or less or equal to if it's only semi-stable. In case that was not clear, when I, when I use this notation of uh, putting in parentheses, that's what it means. It's supposed to go with the other thing in parentheses. So the semi goes with the, the less or equal. Um, okay. And so if you actually write out the terms of the reduced Hilbert polynomial, then it becomes clear that the slope appears in there. And so for torsion-free sheaves, you see that slope stable implies stable, implies semi-stable, implies slope semi-stable. All right, so there's a relationship between all of these. And it's a very, very useful tool to kind of play, play with that, but uh, that won't be the focus today. All right, so as I said, the situation becomes much more complicated on, um, on surfaces. But the dream situation is the projective plane. Because here there's a theorem of Goethe and, and Hershowitz that in rank greater or equal to two, every turning character of a semi-stable sheaf satisfies weak curl nother. All right, that's, a, that's the best you could hope for, right? It's a similar uh, to this, this situation for curves. And here you have that you can just always write off the cohomology groups 
or I mean the dimension of the cohomology groups of any uh, semi-stable sheaf just based on the Euler characteristic and the sign of um, of the slope, right? If, the, if it's and I mean you can work, you can I can show you that uh, in more detail uh, at the end on an iPad, but uh, I mean it's a it's a similar exercise in uh, stereo duality. All right, so you can just read off all the cohomology from this property. Now, regarding the uh, the third question, so I'm mostly going to focus in this talk on the first and the third question, at least for K3 services. Um, regarding globally ge global generation, there's a beautiful theorem of Bertram, uh, Gawler, Johnson, and, and Koskun and, and Heisinga that entirely classifies all moduli spaces, or actually you can say all uh, churn characters um, of globally generated or moduli spaces in which the general object, the general sheaf is globally generated. And their theorem says that the general sheaf in the moduli space is globally generated if and only if either it's the, you know, uh, the trivial sheaf um, of rank uh, the same as the rank of V, right? So it's just the O to however many uh, copies of O, um, or it has positive slope and one of the following things hold. When you tensor by O of minus one, you also get that the Euler characteristic is uh, non-negative, or it's negative, but uh, the Euler characteristic of, of V is at least the rank of V plus two, or you have that it's uh, negative, you know, the, the Euler characteristic of V minus one is negative, the Euler characteristic of V is rank of V plus one, and then you actually know exactly what V is. And so there's a entire, you know, a, a complete classification of globally generated uh, or generic global generation, I should say. Okay. So that's the dream situation where you have a complete, uh, complete classification of everything. Already, when you introduce curves of self intersection negative, things get more complicated. But still, there are, are beautiful results of Koskun and, and Isinga on uh, on rational surfaces with uh, curves of negative ne negative intersection. So on Hirzebruch surfaces um, and other rational surfaces. All right. So there are similar results to P two. It just becomes more complicated, but they exist. Now, when we move to K3 services, then already we see that the, you know, the structure sheaf OX is going to be a problem for us. All right. So here's a fun example. I, th I mean, I think it's fun because I like when uh, Fibonacci numbers appear. Let X be a K3 surface of Picard rank one. And uh, it's a degree two uh, K3 surface. So H, this, its generator H. Uh, satisfies that a squared is equal to two. Okay. Um, by the way, before I enter, uh, go into this uh, this example. Are there any questions? No. Okay. Great. So f i are going to be the Fibonacci numbers. One, you know, so f one is one, f two is one, uh, f three is two, and so on and so forth. And if we look at the moduli space of, of semi-stable sheaves of Mukai vector, and I will tell, tell you what Mukai vectors are in a second, but it's just a convenient way of packaging the, the churn characters. So of the rank is uh, F2K minus one. The first churn class is F2K, and then uh, the second churn class plus, plus the rank is uh, F2K plus one, okay? So this moduli space consists of a single sheaf E, which fits into an exact sequence like this, all right? It's the quotient of a map from O, the trivial sheaf, uh, you know, uh, F2K minus two copies of the trivial sheaf, F2K copies of OH, and uh, it's the quotient of such a map. And if you just take the take the cohomology, you can see that H1 is uh, is non-zero, H0 is non-zero. I mean, H2 is zero, but um, but we have H1 here. Okay, so the cohomology cannot just be read off from um, the Euler characteristic. So we see here, and what causes the problem? What contributes to the H1? It's precisely the fact that O has H2, okay? And this is gonna, this surprisingly, uh, or maybe not so surprisingly, appears a lot throughout uh, the counterexamples that one finds. But let's get into that uh, more carefully. So to put us all on the same page, uh, 
we're going to let now X be a K3 service. Uh, it's always going to be of card rank one. So it's generated by some H, some ample H. Um, and in case, just to, if, you, if you aren't quite sure what I mean by K3 service, it's uh, simply connected and it has uh, its canonical bundle is uh, line bundle is, uh, is trivial. Okay. Okay. Great. So we're going to denote by a squared is, is some even number. So it's gonna, we're going to write it as 2n. And for any coherent sheaf, the Mukai vector v of e is given by, uh, we, we write it as a triple here of the rank, then some integer times h. That's the first turn class. And then this uh, last part, which, as I said, is really just uh, the second turn, uh, turn character plus the rank. So that's what a is. Um, but it's convenient to, to write it in this way. And if you know, want to know where this came, comes from, it's just uh, the turn character times the, the square root of the time class. Okay. So if you look at these Mukai vectors, the whole set of them form a lattice, isomorphic to Z3. And we endow it with a pairing, which is very nice because we see that if we multiply, if we take the pairing between uh, V of E and V of E prime, we, we rig the system so that's negative of the Euler characteristic between them, okay? And that's really where that square root of the tie class comes in. But we have this formula for, for the pairing, okay? All right, and then in, just to, to allow you to quickly read off from the, uh, from the Mukai vector what the Euler characteristic is, right? Since that clearly, clearly is something that is gonna be important for us to know. Um, what the Euler characteristic is, tell us if we have sections or not. Uh, that's just R plus A, all right? So it's, you just add the, the first and the third component. So just a, a bit of background about moduli spaces of sheaves on K3 surfaces. We know we, when they're not empty, um, certainly at least in this case. Uh, so we're gonna let V be a primitive Mukai vector. Since we have a, a lattice, we can talk about whether something is divisible in that lattice or not. And so we can talk about a, pr a primitive Mukai vector. And we say that it's positive if its square is at least minus two and either the rank is positive. So it really should correspond to some kind of sheaf or maybe the rank is zero, but then it should correspond to some sheaf supported on a curve. And that's what this, this condition says. Or if its rank is zero and its first turn character is zero, then it should be a, you know something supported on a, uh, a point or some number of points, and so A better be positive, okay? And so that's what it means to be a positive Mukai vector. And the theorem, which, uh, I mean, I guess in the in parts of this uh, are from Yoshioka, and parts of this are, are from many others. I mean, Heubrecht's, uh, O'Grady, and many, many, many others have uh, Mukai, uh, the, the list is very long, who have contributed to that kind of this culmination theorem that summarizes a lot of their work. And it's let V be a primitive Mukai, uh, positive Mukai vector and M some uh, positive integer, okay? Then we know that M, uh, the, the moduli space of uh, Giesiger semi-stable sheaves of Mukai vector MV is not empty. And we know that either its dimension is given by the formula MV squared plus two, that's the expected dimension, and in that case, you always know that they're the, the open subset uh, or, or sub, uh, sub, you know, the open moduli space parameter, parameterizing stable objects is not empty. Or V squared has to already be uh, either zero or minus two, and M has to be greater than one. So we know exactly, and, and we, always, we actually do know what the moduli spaces look like in those cases as well. And if, uh, if V squared is positive, then the moduli space is always irreducible and normal. In fact, with uh, with uh, Q factorial singularities. Okay, so these are fairly nicely behaved moduli spaces. Um, and our theorem basically shows precisely when kind of the it, I call it like the, the problem free zone. So the first theorem that I want to show you is um, basically tells you exactly where you need to avoid if you want to guarantee that your, your Mukai vector satisfies the weak real other property, okay? So let X be a K3 surface of a card rank one. Denote, uh, again, H squared to be 2N and V to be the Mukai vector R dHA, which we assume is uh, 
at least minus two, that's to ensure that there are stable sheaves there. Um, we assume that R is at least two and D is, is positive. I mean, if D is zero or negative, we know how to, I mean, you just use stair duality, it's not, uh, it's just, this is for convenience, okay? So then the first statement is that if N is at least R, then you always know that V satisfies with one other, okay? So if you're, if you wanna, you know, if you're, if you're fixing your rank, then you know that uh, the only moduli spaces, the only, or the only K3 surfaces that are gonna have um, counter examples to weak brown other are gonna have to have N being smaller than R. So H squared over two is gonna be, have to be smaller than R. Furthermore, if A is less or equal to one, then you automatically know that V satisfies weak brown other. In addition, if D, so, so we have a band now on N, we have a band on, on A, and we have a band on D. Um, and if D is at least R times the floor of R over N, that quantity plus two, then you know that V satisfies weak brown other. Okay. I suppose uh, you see in gray already, you know, the, the answer maybe to the immediate question uh, that you want to ask, which is, are these bounds sharp? And of course, I, I, uh, the answer is, is yes, they are. And I'll show you, I'll show you why. But uh, already from these uh, three uh, inequalities, we see that uh, if we fix R if it, for a given rank, there are only finitely many tuples of N. Uh, well, I, I don't know why I put R there. Sorry, N, D, A, for which V fails, uh, we've run over. Okay, so think, think about what this means. It's not just saying on a fixed, uh, you know, family of K3 surfaces. It's saying that, you know, there are only finally many of these families of, of K3 surfaces on which these counterexamples can exist, which is actually kind of a, a, is, is a much stronger um, statement because you're not you're not even fixing the K3 service on which you're working. You're you're just looking at the the possible Mukai vectors, um, and moreover, as I said, each of these uh, bounds is is sharp. So the moment you let uh, at, at, you know R be um, n plus one, then there is a there exists a, a Mukai vector where which does not satisfy weak brown other. The moment you let a equals two, there exists a Mukai vector that doesn't satisfy weak brown other. And same thing with with d. If you let d be r times the floor of r over n plus one, then again there's a v that says that does not satisfy weak brown other. Um, so these bounds are really sharp. Uh, they say tell you exactly uh, where where to avoid uh, if you want to be free of of, of any counterexamples. Um, and on in all these boundary cases, it's interesting to me at least that O x is always to blame uh, uh, for the the unexpected cohomology. So let me show you some uh, some examples to, to see kind of where these where these things come up, uh, and then I'll explain with the time remaining. I'll explain how we how we can come up with these examples and how we actually have developed a, a machinery to answer this question for any Mukai vector for any given Mukai vector. Um, we can answer this question, uh, and we do so for all ranks up to twenty. Um, but let's let's see some 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 nice counterexamples that show that these these really sharp uh, inequalities. So, H the the ample generator defines a morphism from X to P n plus one, and the pullback of the tangent bundle is a spherical stable bundle on X with Mukai vector uh, given by n plus one and uh, n plus two H and then n squared plus three n plus one. Okay. And the fact that it's a spherical bundle tells us that the, Mukai, the, the moduli space of stable bundles or semi-stable bundles of that given Mukai vector um, consists solely of this, of this one, this one sheaf. Well, we know something about this sheaf though, right? We can pull the, pull the Euler sequence back and we get the following short exact sequence right here. And we can immediately read off what the cohomology of this pullback is, right? We see, I mean, H0, we can calculate just by calculating H1 and then using the other characteristic. And we see that H1 is of this, uh, of this bundle is one. And so V fails weak grown other. And again, 
What causes it? It's the fact that OX has uh, H0 and H2. Um, but this example also note provides uh, it provides um, you know a sh it it provides a, it shows that the bounds one and three of the theorem are sharp. At least uh, the latter one, at least for n, is at least if n is least two, it shows that it's sharp. Okay, and then for for number two, so just to remind you of what that was, that was uh, the bound on A. So the moment that we let A be two, turns out that there is exactly one boundary case here. There's one uh, Mukai vector that fails weak for another, uh, one Mukai vector of the form, sorry, RDH2 um, that fails weak, uh, weak for another, and that's the Mukai vector given by five, three H2. So you, in this order, you may not uh, see the Fibonacci-ness of this, but uh, it's just a flipped Fibonacci sequence of two, three, five. That is important. There is some beautiful kind of uh, stuff going on where these uh, counterexamples come from. But again, we have that this is uh, the single sheaf in its moduli space. And it sits as a quotient of uh, some, some E1, three copies of E1. Uh, by one section. And what is E1? E1 is some, an, another uh, um, stable bundle that happens to satisfy weak grown other. And since it satisfies weak grown other, we know it has no H1. And so the only H1 that E gets is from the H2 of, of O. Okay. So we get, we get our one, uh, one counter example or to, to weak grown other. And uh, there are no others. We're able to show that there are no others. But uh, so th these are the, the boundary cases. Already, just from our theorem, you actually see something interesting that's uh, related to kind of uh, an interdisciplinary topic, uh, that of Ulrich bundles, uh, which are interesting and important in commutative algebra uh, and have, have received a lot of attention lately. Um, so by basically, uh, Using just this uh, this the second um, inequality, the one for for a, we're already able to classify all the Ulrich bundles on a K three surface of Picard rank one, and so this recovers actually a result uh, of uh, a Produ, Farkash, um, and Ortega. And so here's the, the result. So it says that uh, there exists an Ulrich bundle. Um, of rank R with respect to some multiple of, of the ample generator, if and only if two divides um, the rank times the, the multiplicity M, uh, in which case we know exactly what the Mukai vector of the Ulrich bundle is, and it's precisely this. Uh, so I won't go into the definition of, of Ulrich bundles, but the point is that they're defined um, by the vanishing of some cohomology. And so once something is defined by the vanishing of cohomology, then we can use our, our, our theorems about weak grown other to classify such things because we know, oh, if, if it has to satisfy, you know, if it has to have, have no homology, that means that, uh, you know, it has to satisfy weak grown other. And so we actually can play with uh, our theorems to, uh, to answer questions about uh, generic vanishing. And that's why these, these theorems are, are so foundational because they really let you, uh, they answer a lot of questions. A lot of questions can be boiled down to the, the vanishing of a generic uh, sheet, some moduli space. Um, but in particular, it follows that there, if you, if you let, uh, if you take Ulrichness with respect to 2H, then you can get an Ulrich bundle of any rank R at least two. Okay. All right. So that's one application of our, of our theorem. Another is, okay, so we showed that, um, if R is at most N, then there are no counterexamples. So what if we want to push this further? Um, we, the techniques that I'm going to explain in a little bit, uh, we use them to actually classify, for example, all the counterexamples to weak grown other in the region where, where R is between N and 3N. Okay, so let uh, the usual setup, we have a Mukai vector where now R is between N and 3N, D is greater than zero, and V squared is at least minus two. Then we can obtain that, that we, we, we prove that V uh, fails weak grown other, if and only if it's one of the following three cases. So there are only three possibilities here. Um, either V is of this form where it's N plus R1 squared, 
uh, well, I mean, I, I won't, you can, you can see it here, uh, but uh, R1 here is assumed to divide N plus one. And so we see, already see, I mean, that divisibility uh, comes into play a lot with these things. Um, and this is one family in which case uh, the generic E here um, satisfies H1 is equal to one. Uh, and that's that's true of all of these examples. The next one is uh, those uh, Mukai uh, those Mukai vectors of the form R R plus one, N R plus two N, where R is between two N and three N. So that's another uh, counter example where weak one other fails. And then the follow one the the following is the the last one. And those are that's it. So we we classify all all possibilities there. Okay, and. I can keep going and tell you about the counterexamples to weak real nother uh, between three n and four n, and theoretically you could just do this forever. But let me tell you how, about how we actually find these counterexamples. Okay, and the approach kind of has two steps. The first is to repackage our question using derived category techniques. So just to recall, if you have some object in the bounded derived category of your, the product of x and x. We, that's going to be our Fourier Mukai kernel. And we come up with an uh, integral transform, which is called a Fourier Mukai transform, where we pull an object from the second, I mean, from, from x using the second projection. We tensor with e our kernel, and then we push it back using the, the, the first push forward on the, on the first projection. All right, so that's our Fourier Mukai transform. And if you choose the right kernel, sometimes you you can you know reveal interesting things. And so if you choose, um, I mean, I can write this in terms of the kernel. It's it's really the ideal the ideal sheaf of the of the diagonal uh, shifted by two, so the dual shifted by two. But just if you look at this uh, this integral transform here, where I take the Fourier Mukai transform here, corresponding to the ideal sheaf of the diagonal. So that's the copy of x sitting in x times x. And I apply it to some co coherent sheaf E. And then I take the dual. So if that happens to be a coherent sheaf, then I automatically get that all the higher cohomology vanishes. OK, so that means that uh, my Mukai, I mean, my, uh, my sheaf satisfies we've grown out there. Moreover, if it's not just a coherent sheaf, but in fact, it's locally free, well, that's equivalent to E being globally generated. And so we can repackage our question about cohomology vanishing and global generation in terms of simple questions about this object in the derived category, this object uh, phi, phi of E dual, right? If that's a coherent sheaf, we, we know that we're good for weak from other. And if it's locally free, then we know that E is globally generated. And the way we get this, uh, this lemma, I mean, the idea behind it is, is not so, so surprising. You just take the uh, ideal, you know, the, the standard short exact sequence for the, for the ideal sheaf, and then you just kind of trace through what the, uh, what the Fourier Mukai transform does, and you wind up getting a long exact sequence where F is this evaluation map that you care about for global generation. Um, and you get the vanishing of, of H1 and H2 based on the properties of the fact that this is a coherent sheet. Okay, so you basically use uh, standard stuff about local X um, to do that. Are there any questions about that? Okay, so let's keep going. So then the question becomes, all right, so we have this object, we know if we can show that it's a, a coherent sheaf, then where we, we get a positive answer to the question of a uh, weak real node there. So how do we guarantee that it's a sheet? So we're going to use bridge instability. Um, and although this is uh, somewhat technical, the idea is, is fairly simple in the sense that I break up, I, I, I can't uh, you know, get the, the, the conditions of bridge instability satisfied by just using sheaves. So I have to kind of fudge it a little bit by doing what's called, taking what's called a torsion pair. And so I, Consider those sheaves who all their quotients um, have slope bigger than some given uh, number s, and then I look at those uh, objects whose all of whose subobjects have slope smaller or equal to s. I form an abelian category, uh, which is just this is all just like fancy stuff. You don't 
need to worry about this too much. Um, it's just a way of coming up with a, a new category like Cohere Achieves, but that, uh, that will allow us to actually get some new information. Um, so that's all that is. And then the point is that a bridge and stability condition is a pair of this kind of category right here with a function called the central charge, this Z of ST defined um, in this way. So it's just this formula. And the point about this, the important feature here is that the imaginary part is always going to be at least, I mean, on this category AS, uh, the imaginary part is always gonna be uh, greater or equal to zero. And when it's zero, the real part is negative. Okay, so that's the important feature. So you can really view this as, as landing in the upper half plane. And that means that you can define a slope because if I, uh, you know, I mean, I, I can define a slope this way. And it's very similar to the way that uh, slope stability is defined for sheaves. And the point is that in the same way, we call, call something uh, semi stable. If the slope in this way is the, uh, is always smaller or equal to to your object, and and here the sub objects are, are in this category AS. Okay. So here's here's how it works. So now that we understand that we need to 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 study this object given by a phi of uh, e uh, dual, then what we do is we consider the this uh, st plane here over here that the parameterizes all these uh, bridge and stability conditions. And it turns out that there's a region as where, where, where T is sufficiently large. So we start up what's called, near what's called the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, the large radius limit. Then sigma stability, bridge and stability agrees with classical key secret stability. And so we're gonna study our sheaf there and we're gonna start heading towards the origin, okay? In this uh, region between S and D over R. And for technical reasons, we're gonna, we're gonna stay there. And the reason that we do that is because there's the following result from Minamida, Minagida and Yoshioka that once we get to a certain chamber in this uh, ST plane, this chamber C, then the moduli space of bridge and stable objects is, this, is isomorphic via the precise transform that we're trying to understand to a moduli space of sheaves. Of, of semi-stable sheaves, okay? Where the Mukai vector now, A and R are switched. And so if we can guarantee that we start off in G, we start off in the, the Giesiger uh, chamber and we travel down towards this, this chamber C. I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually show you a, a picture um, to explain this a little better. But the point is that if we can succeed in getting to C, then we know that the transform that we're looking at is a sheaf because the, the generic object will be in here. So when you take the transform, it'll be a sheaf, okay? So what is this C? It's, it's the chamber above the wall defined by the slope of this object, uh, you know, the ideal sheaf of a point. You take its dual, you shift by one. So we don't need to worry about that. Just know that there's some wall defined by where the slopes are equal and C is the chamber above that wall. Um, and so we need to know when the generic sheaf E in our moduli space survives to C. So let me just kind of give you this nice picture. We start off up in G and we wanna to get to C in this kind of, in this, uh, kind of uh, rectangle between zero and D over R. Cause we know if we can get there, then our answer is that yes, uh, our, the, the Fourier Mukai transform of our object is indeed a sheaf. And so we have uh, cohomology vanishing. Um, but on the way, we might encounter walls. And in bridge instability in the ST plane, they look like uh, these semicircles, which are nested. So they are either equal or contained entirely one and another. They never just, they never intersect like that. They are always contained one, one inside the other. Okay. And so as we go from G to the chamber uh, C, we might encounter walls where the slope of some sub object of E is equal to it. And so it becomes strictly semi-stable. But the only ones we really worry about are these so-called totally semi-stable walls where everything becomes semi-stable. Everything becomes destabilized. That's gonna prevent me from getting down to C if I, it's, it's this impenetrable wall. But by the work of Byron McCree, we know that those are totally classified. And here's the classification. They're defined by these other Mukai vectors, V1, 
where either it's an isotropic V1, so V1 squared is equal to zero, and it pairs with your V uh, to be equal to one, or it's uh, spherical, so V1 squared is, is minus two, and then it pairs negatively with your V. But the point is that the totally stable walls, the totally impenetrable ones are totally classified. And we, by kind of understanding this picture and playing around with things, we turn this into a completely numerical problem. And we're able to prove that the totally semi-stable walls that obstruct weak real other are governed by a set of Mukai vectors given by these inequalities. So first of all, we don't need to worry about isotropic ones. That's what this part says. You only need to worry about uh, D1 being positive, but smaller equal to D. And then you have that R1D minus RD1 and A1D minus AD1 are both positive. And moreover, since we're, we just need to deal with the isotropic ones, you need that V and B, the pairing of V and V1 is negative. So that actually does define a totally semi-stable wall. But this turns out to be, I mean, this is an entirely numerical problem. And so at some point, we literally just went rank by rank and classified all of these possibilities. Because this, this, the fact that DV being not empty uh, really got, I mean, puts severe restrictions on, on V. Um, numerical restriction. And it turns out that you're able to, um, to actually uh, totally classify by rank by rank, you can actually just have a computer do this. Okay. And the, all of our proofs, say, of the, of the theorem and of everything, I mean, that I'm going to show you afterward, uh, I mean, at some point, comes down to either showing that dv is empty. And so the inequalities that, that in our theorem the, the bounds are basically ensuring that a certain basically subset of DV is, is always empty in those in that region. And if it's not, right, anytime it's not, then you can uh, continue and use kind of an inductive process to study this, uh, this question for the two uh, sub-objects that are, are the totally destabilizing sub-object in, in quotient. Um, or at least, uh, I mean, if you look at the, the hardener nars amount filtration for your, for your object, along the larger, largest totally semi-stable wall, OK? And so if you look at the largest one, that's, that's when all the sheaves, because as you're coming down from the Giesiger semi-stable, the, the Giesiger chamber, the first totally semi-stable wall, the first impenetrable wall that you encounter is going to be the one that you care about. Um, and so you look at that, and that gives you a canonical resolution of the generic object in your moduli space, the generic sheaf in your moduli space, into easier pieces, you hope, you, 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 you hope. Um, and, and indeed, uh, that, that's, that is what happens, uh, in every case that we've ever seen. Um, and then you can use induction to, uh, to, to study the, the sub objects. And if you have that, both of them are sheaves, then you have an extension of sheaves in your, and you know that you have a sheaf. And so that's, that's kind of how, how our, our approach here. Um, what about global generation? So uh, as I promised, uh, there's, you know, that we have results about this as well. and our, our lemma shows that all you need to do is to show that uh, this object is a locally free sheaf. Right? That's equivalent to showing that the, the generic moduli space, the generic sheaf in your moduli space is uh, globally generated. And so we use a lemma of Yoshioka, which, I mean, you don't need to know the details. I mean, here, here are the details, but the point is that these are totally classified. We know exactly when the generic uh, sheaf in a moduli space is not locally free. And so if we can just show that we're not uh, that the flipped Mukai vector A, D, H, R is not, um, so for example, if, if DV is, is, is empty, and so you can get to your, to C, the chamber C, you only need to check that uh, this flipped Mukai vector consists only of uh, non-locally free sheaves, that's going to give you um, your counterexamples. Otherwise, um, it's, it's globally generated. So using that logic, we obtain similar kind of bounds for global generation. Um, so again, our setup here, and here we assume that A is at least two. Um, I mean, you, if you think about the problem of global what it means to be globally generated, it, uh, becomes, it, it soon becomes clear why you can't have A equals zero. Uh, A equals one, we totally uh, classify. And then A is greater than equal to two is, is really the interesting case. Um, and in that case, we show that if any one of the three following uh, conditions are met, then uh, the generic E in, in Chief in your moduli space is globally generated. So if, if n is at least 2r, or um, 
In the case that n is bigger than one, you want uh, d to be at least r times the floor of 2r over n plus 2. Or if n is equal to 1, then you want this condition on d, which amounts to uh, 2r squared plus 2. I mean, it's the same condition as right here, just with n equals 1, obviously. Uh, and then you want uh, a to be less or equal to d minus r over 2. So, and, and if any of those are met, then you know that dv is, is empty and the generic e is globally generated, OK? Um, otherwise, again, if this is, is not empty, you can use induction. And if you have an extension of, of, of locally free sheets, then you know that you have a sheet, a uh, locally free sheet. And uh, this method really allows you to answer either of these questions for any given Mackay vector um, very concretely by just studying the, um, the resolution. So I wanted to, so we, as I said, we were, uh, able to classify all counterexamples of rank up to 20. Um, and we, we had a computer just basically list them all. And we, there are over, I mean, over 600 of them. Uh, and from amongst these, we, we, I first kind of were staring for a long time and identified certain families. Uh, and then we were you kind of able to develop enough tools to calculate the cohomology of every single one of these counterexamples where it's not the expected cohomology. Um, and just to kind of end, end the talk, I wanted to give you a, uh, we've already seen this example. I wanted to give you some uh, kind of taste or flavor of what the kind of counter examples are um, and where they come from. So let, let's do a, a sporadic example to, to close off the talk. So when n equals one, uh, if you consider the Mukai vector 11, 6, H, 3. So you can just look at the uh, inequalities in the proposition and immediately calculate that there's only one such uh, Mukai vector, the uh, destabilizing Mukai vector that you need to worry about, 2H1. Um, and we know that the hardening art of filtration by the work of Byron McCree uh, along this wall is given, given by this, this here, where this um, object here, the, the reflection uh, by E1, um, what I mean by the reflection is it's just that the Seidel Thomas twist around E1, where E1 is this, this spherical uh, bundle. Um, with Mukai vector v1. Okay, so it turns out that this is a moduli space uh, consisting of just e1, this one uh, Mukai vector, I mean, so this one stable sheaf uh, right here. And if you take the Seidel Thomas twist around it, you get that this is the hard, the hard and hard filtration of the generic object in a uh, sheaf in your moduli space. But you can show that, uh, that in fact, this Seidel Thomas twist turns out to be the ideal sheaf of four points twisted by h. If I just study, I mean, now you have a Mukai vector at one H minus two, you study the walls for that one. And you know that this is still the ideal sheaf, um, you know, along the wall that we're, we're considering. And so you actually know that the generic uh, object here is this ideal sheaf of four points. So we know what the, we already know what the cohomology of that. If we take cohomology, we see that here the, we, I mean, two on one, the E two on one, uh, or I mean, I guess this is E one, sorry. E1, we know that it, uh, it's not a counterexample. So this is zero and this is zero. And so we see that H1 of E is the same as uh, H1 of the ideal sheaf of four points twisted by H, okay, which is equal to one. And so we're either, I mean, the, the counterexample is kind of boiled down to either they come from O or they come from something which behaves nicely, but it just happens to have Euler characteristics that's negative. So it contributes H1. Um, but that's kind of the flavor of, of how we do this. So. Uh, other than the families that we kind of identified and, and could do uh, in general, then there, you know, were these sporadic ones where we just literally take the the largest wall and we understand the resolution and we can uh, use our, use our our tools to study the resolution. But uh, you can we can do this. I mean, for any Mukai vector that we're given, and so far we've never we've never been been able to uh, we've never found something that we weren't able to answer. Um, but uh, I'll stop stop there. Thank you. Um, okay, we have uh, a few minutes for questions, actually, this is nice. Um, are there any questions from the audience? You can unmute yourselves or write in the chat if for some reason you can't or don't want to speak and I'll, I'll read them for you. Uh, can I ask a question? Of course, of course, yeah. So, 
uh, in our theorem, you assume this uh, PK rank to be one. So is this uh, uh, used in the proof? Um, so there are certain features which don't need uh, PK rank one, but in, certainly in terms of the inequalities, yeah, I mean, that's what the, the, the fact that these inequalities are so simple is because it's PK rank one. Uh -huh. But in principle, I mean, this can be, can definitely, this technique can definitely be used and generalized to other services and uh, uh, certainly Picard, uh, Picard, higher Picard rank uh, K3 services um, with a lot more work and, and care. The, the tools are there. It's just that, uh, you know, the cases become harder because you're working, you're no longer working in, uh, I mean, this picture of, of just the circles, that's all there is when it's Picard rank one. But when you have higher Picard rank, there are more interesting uh, kind of uh, 3D walls going on in the Bridgeland moduli space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, can I ask you a, a, another question? Yeah, yeah, you can yeah, ask sure. as much as you want. This is relaxed. We're only 10. It's uh -huh. like uh, friends, yeah? So you, you can mm -hmm. ask as much as you want. You know. uh, so, so this may, may, might be naive. So uh, maybe can you, can you go to the slide uh, uh, around the middle of the talk, uh, talking about the two boundary cases for the Mukai vector? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, the, yeah. yeah can I go can I go to the second case the second case uh so for example in, in this uh, exact sequence could you uh so how you you already, uh, how how do you write down this uh, uh Jordan holder filtration for for e right so so basically in this case you know that uh the I mean so biomimicry not only tell us how, how you know how to find the totally semi-stable wall. They also, as I kind of intimated at the end, tell us how, how you know, what the harder in our Simon filtration of the generic object looks looks like. And so when you actually, I mean, to in this example, uh, you just compute D, DV. You see that, uh, if I remember in this case, it consists of, uh, I mean, certainly it consists of uh, this one. No, yeah, it's just it's just this, uh, it's just this e one, um, and so you you have only one object to worry about. You only you know that there's only one totally semi-stable wall that you need to worry about, and so you just look at the resolution along there. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is that in this case, so it looks a little different than the one than the other ones, and the reason is because the truth is that O X is not in the category. Uh, in the region that we're talking about, but OX shifted by one is. And so what this looks like actually in terms of the resolution is three copies of E1 inside of this A, that's what I'm saying, inside of the, the AS. So three copies of E1 goes into E and the quotient is OX shifted by one, mm -hmm. okay? And so, I mean, in, in that OX shifted by one is the, the Seidel-Thomas twist of E around E1. And that's, I mean, that's how, that's how you get it. But uh, we, I mean, once you see the the Bukai vector of of o, o, o of shifted by one, then you know you know that you have O of shifted by one for technical reasons, and so that's how you get this uh, this kind of resolution. But really, I mean, like, you, I just we just had the computer like tell us, okay, here are the example, here are the cases of V which don't have which have a DV that's not empty, and here's it, what's in their DV. You can just look, you can draw the the circles, see which one's the the biggest one, and then look at the resolution along there. So it's like very explicit, uh, this, this technique. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, I have a question. You said that uh, you constructed these counter examples uh, using software, which- yeah. Which which software did you use out of curiosity? So uh, so just Mathematica. Mm -hmm. I I just I, I just use reduce the command reduce. It takes inequalities and basically like will give you either it will crunch them down to a simpler inequality or it will give you all the solutions to the inequality. And in this case, there I mean it just would print out for each rank the list of of inequalities. All right. 
Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, let's thank Howard again. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye now.